My name is Adam Painter. I am one of the pastors on staff here at Church at the Gates, and I have the honor and privilege of really doing what that last line said in that song we just sang, that I get the privilege of telling the world, telling you, telling Facebook and YouTube of the treasure that I've found in Jesus Christ. One of the things that we need to really remember is that song we just sang, Oh, Come to the Altar. The line right after that says that the Father's arms are open wide. And I think so often, maybe we know that, but we don't fully believe that, or we don't really fully trust that. And I think a lot of us, those that are either following God or are not following God, think God is like this. He's got his arms crossed kind of waiting for us to get our act together before coming to him. But spoiler alert, as we will find out today, the Father's arms are open wide. And what we will see is that we have a sympathetic mediator on our side. That God is a God who is accessible, and God is a God who is approachable. We started our trek through the entire Gospel of Mark a year and a half ago. We are nearing the end of this verse-by-verse journey. We've only got two weeks left. Our senior pastor, Mark Pritchard, will be back next Sunday to close out this book of the Bible. But before we jump into today's text, I would ask you to pray this simple prayer today. Lord, change me today. Because we want to be a people that is growing that when we look back on months and years past, that we're not just this stagnant life that we're living, but that God is actually growing us in ways that are tangible and that we can celebrate. So please please pray that prayer, and I will close us this morning. Father God, pray that you would move today. God, that you would change us today, that you would give us eyes to clearly see what you have done for us, give us ears to clearly hear what you've done for us, and that you would grow us, and that you would change us to be more like your son, Jesus Christ. God, I'm so grateful that you are a God who is accessible, a God who is approachable, and we don't have to try to figure out this life on our own. God, I pray that today you would help me to articulate your word in a way that is found faithful. Lord, we love you. It is in your son's name we are able to pray. Amen. So for the day today, we are going to be in Mark chapter 15, and we're covering a lot of text, verses 1 through 39. So I would like you to open up your copies of God's Word. Maybe you brought your own Bible today. Maybe you have a Bible app on your phone. If you don't have either of those, we have these blue Bibles that are in the seatback chair right in front of you. I would like you to open up to Mark chapter 15. In those blue Bibles, we'll be sitting on pages 497 and 498. I want you to see this in front of you today because I didn't type it up. There's 40 verses. I didn't type it all into the PowerPoint. So I want you to see it in front of you today as we walk through really the last hours of the life of Jesus Christ. In my preparation for this Sunday's message, I was conflicted about what to focus on over these 40 verses today. I've only got about a half hour of your time. What should I omit? What should I skip? What should I focus on or drill down on? And I really felt led to read it all to you. The last few hours of the life of Jesus Christ. I felt strongly that God knows how to document history better than I do. That God knows how to tell his story better than I do. So I'm not going to paraphrase parts of it for the day today. But I'm going to put it in front of you. And my goal is to let the Bible speak for itself today. To quickly recap where we have been the last two Sundays, Jesus just endured an illegal trial in the middle of the night where he finally states to the religious council that he is the Son of God. And not only is he the Son of God, but he will be seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. And he will be seated there in power. Peter, his right-hand man in his earthly ministry, just went through a trial of his own. And he failed miserably. 
He denied ever knowing Jesus Christ. And yet we saw in the last verse of the last chapter that he wept bitterly, that amidst his cataclysmic sin, he is sorrowful and repentant, that he has a posture that is humble. And when we come with that humble posture, restoration and rehabilitation await. So, We're going to break this down kind of verse by verse. I'll start off with the first five verses in Mark chapter 15. Here we go. God's word reads like this. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, you have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. This is another instance of a common occurrence that we have seen throughout the book of Mark. There's more people equally guilty of not recognizing truly who Jesus Christ is. And this continues today around the world that people hear about this man who lived 2,000 years ago but don't truly understand or recognize what he did. This short phrase that he uses in verse 2 is almost like linguistic jujitsu, that when he's asked a a question of, are you the king of the Jews, he kind of puts it back on him. He says, you have said so. And he's always doing this because he's always putting it back on the other person. He wants to make sure that they fully understand that they know that it is their decision when they walk him towards his death. That their words and actions are what they are accountable for. And look in verse 5, right at the end there. It says that Pilate, Pontius Pilate, was amazed. This is a guy who was the chief officer or governor of Rome. He has no doubt seen many criminals in his day. And yet he is stunned by the way that this man, Jesus Christ, is carrying himself amidst injustice. How often do we cry out, life is unfair, this is unfair. And yet Jesus is going through immense injustice. And amidst it all, he's carrying himself in a way that this governor is speechless. He's blown away by how Jesus is walking through this. So to the believers in here, for those that would say, yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm following Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. My question to you is this. Know that people are watching you. Those that are far from the Lord are watching you. How are you going to handle injustice? How are you handling when life is unfair? Will they be amazed at how you handle it? Will you handle injustice with peace, self-control, a calm demeanor? Or will those watching you lump you into the pile of society that is shook every time something unfair happens in your life? Let's keep going. Verses 6 through 10. Now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. This is Pilate. He used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked, And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them saying, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. Pilate, no doubt, is a smart guy. And he realizes in this moment that the religious elite of the day, the religious council that is trying to get him, They're doing it out of envy, out of jealousy, that they're angry because they're seeing success following in the wake of Jesus Christ and his life. Let's keep going, verses 11 through 15. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, 
He delivered him to be crucified. Pilate asks repeatedly in this part, trying to make the Jewish authorities solely responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus. He's almost given them like another chance. Like, what has he done? Don't you want to let him go? Like, don't you want to relent and, and let him off the hook? He keeps asking them, what shall I do with this man? What evil has he done? And yet what we see, which is very sad in verse 15, is Pilate wishes to satisfy the crowd. He fears for his own job, his own safety, his own personal well-being. Pilate gives in to peer pressure, makes his decision based on what he thinks will satisfy the crowd. And as we think about our own lives, how often do we make decisions in life based on trying to impress someone or to appease someone? And this is one of your takeaways for the day today. Regardless of the amount of peer pressure, we will be held accountable for the decisions we make. Regardless of the crowd pushing you to do something, we will be held accountable for the decisions that we make. That when we stand before the Lord at the end of our life and God asks, why did you make that decision, Adam? My reply can't be, well, everybody was telling me to do it, so I just felt like I should do it that we need to stand up and do the thing that God would applaud. Do the right thing in the moment, regardless of the amount of peer pressure. Doing the right thing in this moment for Pilate probably would have cost him something dearly. We talked about that last week, that we shouldn't be surprised when God puts conviction on our heart to do the right thing, and we know, man, it might cost me something in this life. Pilate came to that fork in the road, and he chose to go his own way, to protect himself and not do the right thing. And because this happens under his jurisdiction, he is still held accountable for his hand in the death of Jesus Christ. And you need to know that Pilate in this moment, he had the power to pardon any criminal that he wanted to. He could have let Jesus Christ go. But he wanted to protect himself and his own power and his own status in life. The irony here. Pilate will free a convicted rebel against Rome instead of a righteous man who has not spoken anything against Rome. If anything, Jesus stuck up for Rome. He told people to pay their taxes to Rome. Barabbas, the prisoner, the one sentenced to death, gets to go free. Jesus, the one innocent and sinless, gets sentenced to the most torturous death ever invented. And what is stated so succinctly here at the very end is he is scourged. This scourging was a brutal form of torture that was intended to shorten the amount of time someone was hanging on the cross for crucifixion. This torture involved stripping a man's clothes, tying their hands around a thick post, and then beating them with a leather whip woven with bits of bone or metal in it. And this whipping was so brutal that some even died before they made it to their crucifixion. This beating is inflicted upon Jesus Christ. Verse 16 through 20. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed, and spitting on him, and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. This is a big crowd around him. This whole battalion is around 600 soldiers when at full strength. And as you'll see in this account of the crucifixion, as well as in all the other three Gospels, the documentation of Jesus' actual crucifixion is pretty short. None of the authors get into graphic detail about the utter savagery of this torture. It isn't sensationalized, but what is detailed meticulously is the amount of shame and mockery that is heaped upon this sinless man. The ridicule, the harassment, the jeering is seemingly endless. 
The writer of this gospel emphasizes what was accomplished by Jesus on the cross rather than the horrors of it. And what we see here is Jesus suffering sacrificially, and he expects his followers to do the same. We've talked about that for several weeks now. And one of the things that we can take away from the day today is this, is that we should be praying daily for the strength to suffer well for the sake of Jesus Christ. He's called us to follow him, to lay down our selfish desires and follow him, knowing that at times it may be hard. He was the suffering servant. And that is what we're called to follow in. Taking up his cross in this moment is the supreme act of self-denial, that we are called to lay down our selfish desires for the betterment of others. And this idea of praying daily for the strength to suffer well for the sake of Jesus Christ is, I'm sure for some in the room, just thinking about the work week is overwhelming. For some in here, thinking about September when kids go back to school might feel overwhelming. For some, thinking about 2022 seems overwhelming. God doesn't want us to heap up prayers just when we're sitting in here for all of that time frame. But God wants a constant dialogue with us, a constant relationship. That's what prayer on a daily basis looks like. That I don't have to worry about tomorrow or next month or next year, but I can pray today. God, give me the strength today to do what you would applaud, to make the decisions that bring you glory, and to suffer well for the sake of Jesus Christ. Verse 21. And they compelled the passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. So Jesus is just mocked, he is beaten, and all of a sudden he takes his crossbar and starts carrying it up to the hill where they are going to nail him to it. And he, his body is so weak from being whipped that he needs help. And they bring somebody in to help carry that cross. Jesus has been preaching and teaching about denying yourself and taking up your cross in order to fully follow him. And Simon is the first one in scripture to physically live this out. And if you're sitting in here today and you're like, how do I know any of this is true? What's the point of this? Is this just a fairy tale? Is this just some story that really sells a bunch of books? If you want to know Part of why this is truth and you can trust this is because this gospel was written at a time when these two people in here, Alexander and Rufus, were still alive. So think about, can you imagine making a wild, fictitious claim when a reader could go and talk to Alexander and Rufus and say, did that really happen? Were you there? These people can vouch. They saw it. The truth and veracity of Scripture is real. This document is real history of something that took place 2,000 years ago, and that should grow your confidence in trusting the Bible. Verses 22 through 23. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. This wine mixed concoction would have a numbing effect to numb some of the pain that he was going through. And it should show you something about his commitment to you that he chose not to take it. Jesus was willing to take and feel the full punishment for my sin. He was willing to take and feel the full punishment for your sin. Verse 24. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them, to decide what each should take. His clothes, taken, divided up among the soldiers. They cast lots or, or played a game similar to dice, a, a game of chance to see who would get his garments. And in this time period, these last hours of the life of Jesus Christ, he is stripped naked twice, in public, in front of crowds. Most of us are uncomfortable just standing naked in front of a mirror by ourselves. And yet this happens multiple times to this sinless man. This is an obvious move to attempt to shame and embarrass Jesus Christ. Verses 25 through 32. 
And it was the third hour, which is the third hour of daylight around 9 a.m. when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot, cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. Crucifixion was done publicly in an attempt to deter anybody else from rebelling against the Roman governing authorities. It was a show to try and intimidate people that they would see and say, see this body hanging here, publicly humiliated and brutalized? This will happen to you too if you don't fall in line with what we're yelling at you to do. The mockers here at the end of verse 32 they understand, they admit, they know Jesus has the power to save. And they understand that Jesus wants them to believe, but yet these people flat out reject him and his instruction for their lives. This happens all too often still today, that most in America know about Jesus Christ, and yet many still reject him. Verse 33. And when the sixth hour had come, the sixth hour of daylight, that'd be noon, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, until 3 p.m. So all of a sudden, he's crucified, hanging on the cross, still alive, and yet darkness comes over the land for three hours, between noon and 3 p.m., which, as we all know, is typically the brightest time of the day, when the sun is highest in the sky. And what we know about this time is that the Passover feast is taking place, and that only happens when there is a full moon. And in a full moon, the moon is behind the earth, so the sun's here, earth here, moon is here. There's no way for the moon to be in between the earth and the sun to make a solar eclipse. So there's no way for this to be chalked up as, oh, just a coincidence, just a natural phenomena. All of a sudden it got dark, same time they crucified this guy. No, this unnatural darkness is a show of divine judgment. It is ominous. And anybody there would have realized something terribly wrong just took place. Verse 34 through 37. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last what he's saying there in verse 34 is he's reciting the opening lines found in Psalm 22 in the Old Testament. He is crying out from the immense pain of the crucifixion as he suffers as a substitute for sinful humanity. He is fully human in this moment, fully feeling the splinters of the cross on his back, fully feeling the nails driven into his skin. And in verse 37, we see him cry out. But know this. It is a cry of victory. The last words that are recorded in the Gospel of John of what Jesus said is, it is finished. That is a cry of a victorious king. Satan has been defeated. Death has been defeated. Death has lost its sting, and we don't have to fear it anymore. This past spring, on April 2nd, we commemorated Good Friday and taught through the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and if you want to know more about what was accomplished when those nails were driven through his hands and through his feet, I'd urge you to listen to that. That link is on our Facebook page right now. Verse 38. So Jesus just utters a loud cry, takes his last breath, and right after that, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. 
And what you need to know about this temple, this temple is kind of the epicenter of the religious faith at the time. There was a veil or a curtain that separated the two spaces in the temple. So on one side of the temple, there was a space where God's earthly dwelling presence was located. The other space in the temple involved the rest of where sinful men and women dwelt. And in between there is a curtain, a divider, a veil. This signified that humans were separated from God due to sin. Only the high priest was permitted to go past the curtain once each year to enter into God's presence for all of Israel and make atonement for their sins. And you need to know that this curtain was massive. It was between 60 and 75 feet tall. And it's not paper thin either. It's four inches thick. It is impossible for any human to tear. So when you see this 70-foot tall curtain that's four inches thick, all of a sudden torn from top to bottom, that is no doubt a God move. There's no other way to explain that. When that curtain is torn down, the holy presence of God, sinful humanity, when that curtain is taken down, access to God is now granted because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. This means that the temple sacrifices are no longer needed from this point forward. The ripping of the veil is a sign of the sufficiency of Jesus' atonement or payment for our sins. You now have access into God's presence. You don't need a priest to do that. You can go straight to him right now today because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Our mediator or intercessor, as the Bible describes it, between us and God the Father is Jesus. This curtain being torn down showcases that we have access to heaven for all believers. Verse 39. So Jesus just takes his last breath, cries in victory. The curtain of the temple is torn. And when the centurion or Roman soldier who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. Even the centurion believes. Even the soldier believes. This soldier has likely seen many people die in torturous ways. This is likely not his first time crucifying somebody. When you talk to police officers, firefighters, doctors, or nurses, those on the front lines that see people die on a somewhat regular basis, they almost build up kind of a immunity to it, a sort of toughness of the skin to be able to endure it. This could have happened to this centurion, to this Roman soldier. He's gotten used to seeing people hanging on a cross. But something is drastically different about this person that he just witnessed the last six hours of Jesus' life on the cross. Something is different. In that moment, this Roman soldier meets the real Jesus. And he experiences real change, real transformation in this life. And we at this church still believe that today. That we feel God has wired this church body to be a body of people that are real, that are authentic. We don't just go through the motions, put on our Sunday best and our happy face and act like life is easy. But that we are real, genuine, authentic people that are transparent and humbly following the Lord and that when we bring other people into this room to meet the real Jesus, not just the one that you heard some snippets about on Facebook or the one that was maybe watered down when you were a kid, but the real Jesus of the Bible, we still believe today that you can experience real change, real transformation in your life. The centurion did. There was something different about this man. If you only have one takeaway for the day today, I want you to take this away. Jesus Christ is our sympathetic mediator who allows us to approach God confidently and boldly. Jesus Christ is our sympathetic mediator who allows us to approach God confidently and boldly. Jesus' mission is not one of self-help or self-fulfillment. He's not trying to live his best life. He is a ransom for others. A ransom is a debt paid in order to release a prisoner. That we are slaves to sin, chained and imprisoned to our sinful ways. 
And Jesus frees us from that bondage that when I heap up debt because of my sin, a massive debt, Jesus says, I'll pay that tab. I got that covered. I'm a ransom for that. We talked about it at the beginning. Many feel God is like this to them. Arms crossed, sour face, disappointed in you. Father's arms are open wide. Jesus Christ is our sympathetic mediator. He is accessible. He is approachable. The curtain has been torn because of what he accomplished on the cross. Where do we get this language of being sympathetic and boldly and confidently approaching God? I'm glad you asked. Hebrews 4, chapter 14, chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. There are many in here just looking for love. I want to feel loved. I want to be loved. Know that you can confidently and boldly approach God, that he loves you. He's waiting for you with his arms open wide because of what his son accomplished. Let's pray. Father God, these 39 verses uh, are tough to sit in. Uh, are tough at times to digest, tough to picture what your son went through for our sake so that we could be made right with you. God, it is hard to fathom the debt that was paid for our sinful state. God, I pray that you would give us the posture of Peter, that we would come to you with a humble posture, looking for restoration, and looking for rehabilitation. God, I'm grateful that you are a God that is accessible and approachable. God, give us the confidence to draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Lord, we love you. It is in your son's name we pray. Amen. So today's message, uh, not many jokes in there, not many uh, smiley faces in my notes. Uh, It's a little tough, but man, once you realize the freedom that comes from what took place 2,000 years ago, once you realize, man, I'm not chained to my sin anymore. I don't have to go through this life alone trying to figure it out on my own. When you realize that, that freedom That weight is taken. If you have been transformed by the gospel, if if you have been transformed by what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross, we would ask you to partner with us in this ministry to make sure that the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ continues to go out. There are several different ways that you can partner with us, link arms with us in this church. Uh, When it comes to the offering, you can give online at churchinmissoula.com. You can text the word GIVE to the number that you see on your screen, 530-8810. We have an offering box that is attached to the back wall. If you're old school and you want to mail something, you're welcome to do so. Our address is on the screen, 3821 Stevens Avenue, Missoula, Montana, 59801. If you're new to Church at the Gates, if this is your first time, if you're still sitting here saying, I don't know that this thing's real. I don't know that there's actually a God that loves me. That's all right. I'm glad you're here to wrestle with that. This is a great place to wrestle. The gift that you can give to us is filling out one of those next steps cards, sticking your name on there, an email address or a cell phone number. We would love to just reach out to you, let you know that we're grateful for you because what we know is it takes courage 
to come to a church where you don't know anybody. It takes bravery to come to a church when you don't know what to expect. And so we want to applaud you for that. We are going to sing two last songs here for the day today. Uh, The first one is Give Me Jesus. The last one is called How Great Is Our God. And some of the lyrics in this next song, Give Me Jesus, talk about, God, you can have it all. But give me Jesus. That when we think about our lives, that money, fame, having the perfect boyfriend or girlfriend, that all of those things are nice gifts, but in and of themselves, they won't produce long-lasting joy. But when we know and we boil it down that, God, you can have it all, because I know if I have the love of the Father, that's enough. God, give me Jesus. I'd ask you to please stand with us as we close in worship.